Hey, Ed, was there any confusion for you uh, with the bigger number one here as to which issue we were starting with last week? It does seem like a little bit of a scam, right? Like uh, at the heyday of issue one fever, height of the speculator boom, that they would make sure to make the make that number one seem very prominent on the cover when uh, guys are just in the shop or whatever, combing through books and they see a big number one, buy five copies of an issue two. That's a good way to do it. So welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. This is Wizard Magazine number two, October 1991. I'm Jim Rugg. My name's Ed Piscor. And today we're going to be discussing the second issue of Wizard Magazine, uh, this one features Ghost Rider on the cover, one of the most popular characters of the early 90s, uh, by artist Javier Salteris. They continue to hype previews, price guide, and this issue features an interview with Chris Claremont. They continue featuring a character with their wizard cape, wizard hat, uh, you know, promoting their magazine. Uh, classic. I remember Dave Sim always talked about doing Cerebus when people would request a character sketch at a show or whatever. He would be happy to draw, you know, Captain America or Wolverine, but it would be Cerebus in those costumes. So I think Wizard may have uh, similar ideas. Now Comics, uh, advertising front inside cover. Not too much to say about Now Comics. I didn't read Now Comics. Very few. Uh, Bill Boyshell, the proprietor of uh, the famous uh, Copacetic Comics here in Pittsburgh, he ha he has this funny this funny. Uh, kind of sort of maxim about uh, some of these independent publishers of the day. And he talks about how the name of the company um, points out the deficiencies of said company. For instance, now comics were always late. Innovation, innovative comics uh, did almost <laughs> all licensed properties. And uh, the British uh, quality comics printed really crappy uh, quality stuff. That's funny. <laughs> I always saw, you know, Green Hornet and and Cato comics with Now, and I don't. I've never read Green Hornet. I never watched Green Hornet. Is that something that you were into ever? Little bits. Whenever Green Hornet and Cato would show up on the Adam West um, and Burt Ward Batman show, but the fact that that Bruce Lee was Cato was that was a big deal. That's you know, really cool. Yeah, for for, for, sure. for our parents' generation, they were down with Green Hornet and, and Cato. Um, one note, the artist for Cato, for Cato is Brent Anderson, who we would later see in Astro City. Yeah, and before that, I mean, he did he did some journeyman work for Marvel. And then the other note is um, this Twilight Zone cover is drawn by Mitch O'Connell, who's kind of a pop artist, illustrator guy. Uh, I like his work. It's very colorful. He did a little bit of comics here and there, probably best known in comics for Ginger Fox which was before his mature style. So it's not as exciting, you know, if you like his cover work or illustration. Sadly, Ginger Fox isn't the best representation of that. I think he did some heavy metal comics as well. Uh, Previews Magazine, um, one of the big distributors, you know, Diamond Comic Distributors, having their own uh, catalog of what was coming out and method of ordering those comics from whatever comic book store or whatever online service well i guess not online but mail order service you would have used at the time and of course jim lee's x-men uh, very prominently featured table of contents um nothing too exciting there we see picture of chris claremont famous x-men writer uh for all of my childhood virtually all of my time reading x-men hot off the heels of of the wild success of x-men number one eight eight point five million copies of that baby sold and if you saw the Stan Lee videos from from the 90s um that that you know the straight to video interview series that he did Chris Claremont was on there and right right around this time and Stan Lee asks well what did you do with all those royalties and he bought and he mentions the airplane that he bought uh -huh. it's called a Cessna Bonanza and I'm a Schnurrer, right? So I looked that up online. $300,000 aircraft. And he bought that for his mother? For his mother. Yeah, yeah. She she wanted to be in the in the Royal Air Force. But at the time uh, that, you know, she would have been in, in, in the Air Force or the, or the, the military, no women pilots uh, over there in the UK. Um, so, you know, she still got her pilot license, though. Yeah, good good for her, good for him. That's that's a pretty proud moment, I think, for a mother whenever their son buys them an airplane. Um, all right, so we'll get into the issue then. Um, 
letter from Garib Shamus. Uh, I think most of the Wizard magazines open with these. Nothing too interesting in this letter. Um, he mentions getting a computer. This would have been 1991 again. So, you know, kind of in line, I think, with especially a professional and a publisher. That seems right. The editorial that he would produce, I would... I got the feeling that it would have been the the last thing to be finished before the magazine goes to press. And I detect a lot of enthusiasm in this editorial that, uh, you know, whatever he was planning to do with Wizard Number 1, obviously he was successful in his ideas. And he talks about how the, the magazine, um, you know, you can't find it anywhere. Uh, it's sold out. Um, and he is just kind of highlighting some of the changes that are, that are taking place. He, because the magazine was successful, he was able to, to add, um, 20 something more pages, which changed the binding so yeah. that it's a more traditional magazine binding, perfect bound, uh, for us book nerds. Yeah. That's the format of wizard. One thing we'll see in these first several issues is the magazine shaping up into the format that then it, it holds for quite a while. Um, that first issue was, uh, saddle stitched which again, for, for the binding nerds, um, that's not something I remembered. And, and here in issue two, we get the perfect binding and this is what I'm used to. You know, I, I didn't start reading is, issue one whenever I started Wizard as a kid. And so like seeing that first issue, that one did feel different and it did not last. You're right. You know, he mentions being much more successful uh, maybe than he expected and instantly makes these changes. So that works for me. I, I like this format. Um, I keep looking at, Big Bob's ads, and it's funny for me to see X Men number one. I think we all uh, are I well see, aware of that. I see where you're going. With Next to Wonder <laughs> Wonder Man number one. Uh, I'm not sure how many people still have that one in their collection, but uh, I it actually did not do. quite land uh, with the same scale as, as X Men number one. I had Silver Sable number one too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I bought all of those number ones. I bought Wonder Man number one. It just hasn't made the cut as I've gone through my collection over the years. But I would buy... That was a period when I was buying all the number ones that Marvel was putting out. But uh, Wonder Man didn't stick with me. We talked about Dragon's Den last last issue. I do love seeing the, the ads and seeing the comic book shops. Um, that's something that I look forward to continuing as we go through these issues. Seattle Tacoma Comic Con. Uh, Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, free autographs. Uh, that's changed quite a bit over the years. <laughs> yeah, so here we are, uh, Chris Claremont interview, talking about X Men. Of course, this is you know his main main title. I think this is what everybody knows Chris Claremont from. What they think of when they think of Chris Claremont, and this is basically just part of that Marvel press push of promoting. More X books, uh, relaunched X books, and obviously building on the momentum of having an eight million copy selling X Men book. Um, so, kind of straightforward. He gives a little bit of background on what he has planned, uh, what the editors had in mind. Yeah, we should talk about that. So, the editor in chief was was Tom DeFalco at the time, and this kind of illustrates the difference between the corporate people and and the creatives. Like why. Now, I know uh, DeFalco wrote Thor and has written comics and all this, but his idea for what a second X-Men book would be was simply just more of the same. That's all he wanted it to be. Just uh, instead of instead of Uncanny X-Men being a bi-weekly book the way it was uh, before, you know, for a certain stretch of time, why not just have two titles? Um, focusing on the same basically five characters... And at this point, Claremont established and created dozens and dozens of characters that, that he, frankly, loves. Uh, when he talks about his characters, he doesn't think of them as characters. He calls them by name, and he says things like, Kitty wouldn't like that. You know, he I mean, he's really invested in, in the material that, that he created, and you know, thankfully, like his, his idea sort of won out, um, at least at the beginning. Yeah. And it's worth noting at the same time of, of this X-Men launch, Superman was publishing, I think four titles and they really were treated like almost like a weekly, you know, um, they were coordinated very, in a very detailed manner where the writers and editors would plot out 
sometimes a year or more of story. And then each book was responsible for, you know, X amount of that story. Right. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I'm sure, you know, Tom DeFalco is looking around at the competition and it's like, that seems like a viable method to, you know, create multiple books within the same family. Yeah, I guess so. It's just a very corporate stance to take, um, when it's like, okay, we have this successful thing, so let's just do more of the same rather than trying to, you know, strike, strike twice or something. Now, last issue, when we were going through that, that Todd McFarlane interview, you made note about, um, about like early Photoshop, uh, desktop publishing, um, but this is clearly pasted up. Like it looks like it could have been like a serial killer scrapbook. Like, <laughs> like this is cut out, like not even with an exacto blade, but with scissors, uh, scissors. I really hope it gets uh, captured well <laughs> on, on film, man. But, but there's nothing, uh, digital about the, the paste ups on, on at least the graphic. Yeah, that's a good call. That's a, that's a pretty basic. <laughs> and, and there's a couple more. You could even see the shadow. Yeah, you can see his face clearly cut out and, and pasted on there is, is, is pretty funny. Um, one thing I would note on this first page is he references uh, television shows. And the shows he lists are Hill Street Blues, L.A. Law, and Northern Exposure. Right, because it's a big ensemble cast where all the characters kind of need to get a little bit of stage time. So... Yeah, and here we go. I've known them all too long. I couldn't play favorites anymore. Uh, Claremont describing his relationship with these characters uh, that you had mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and it makes sense. F 15 or 16 years writing these characters, many of whom he created, he certainly developed as characters. Uh, you know, from my own limited experience making comics, I understand exactly what he means. You do kind of quickly start to think about these characters interacting with the world the way you would imagine uh, a real living person. So it makes sense to me that he takes that approach. In the in the body of this interview, when he's describing what Tom DeFalco had, everything that we just said before, he one of the reasons why he wanted to cover all of the characters was because he knew he was going to be working with different artists. Um, the artists at this point would have been... Uh, uh, Wills Portacio on Uncanny X-Men and Jim Lee on the adjectiveless X-Men. And he just talks about the, the sh that, you know, different artists have different strengths. And then he talks about like how throughout his entire career, this has been standard operating procedure. Dave Cockrum leaned heavy um, toward Nightcrawler. And then when John Byrne pops <laughs> on the book... He doesn't want to draw Nightcrawler. He wants to draw Wolverine. And those are just like, that's sort of the basic stuff. But the more you get into a collaborative process and you learn that like perhaps th this artist doesn't like to draw cars so much or, or that artist doesn't like to draw tech, the the popular example that Chris Claremont is not ashamed of giving is, is uh, well, he doesn't call the person out by name, but he said in an old issue when Power Pack shows up, um, it looked like a bunch of should we say little people? <laughs> That's uh, probably what we should say. Yeah, uh, running around in, in the issue, and he talked with the artist and said, "Listen, if uh, if you weren't comfortable drawing kids, I we could have called an audible. We could have done something else." Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I've seen him emphasize that in other interviews too. The dynamic that each artist brings to the collaboration, and a lot of these artists do end up as co plotter you know, getting credit as co-plotters. So it is significant and probably explains part of how he's able to maintain a career that long on one book, that ability to, to mesh with different artists. So um, this is the cover, uh, cover wraparound cover of Uncanny X-Men 281. Yeah, just want to show off, there's a color version of that from the actual issue. And there's, uh, it's drawn by Will Sportaccio. And there he is using those, there's Iceman using his powers in the way that you like. Yeah, I do like that. This always struck me as an odd composition with Jean Grey and Storm kind of overlapped, but butting up against each other. Like it's not, yeah, it's not a very dynamic overlap. It's, it's, it's kind of strange. It's almost a 3D image, you know, where the images are just next to each other. Uh, that image always stood out to me as being just a little bit, a little bit strange. Like they're fighting for uh, who gets to be the leader, maybe. <laughs> On this page, we have Claremont uh, just continuing to talk about all of his his hopes and dreams and, and plans with where he's going to be taking X-Men and some of the things that, that he he wants to explore with the series. Um, 
and and uh, and then you know the main interview closes out right here, and then we have this little epilogue. Yeah, interesting epilogue indeed. This is uh, as this issue was going to press, apparently, due to editorial differences, Chris Claremont leaves the X books, you know, and it's like this whole interview is set up to launch this new direction and these two new X titles that Chris Claremont's kind of the architect behind. And interview concludes, I guess a day or two later, they receive word that Chris Claremont is leaving the X books. Uh, This epilogue just mentions that's what happened. They invited him to do an addendum to the interview, which he declined. I'm, I'm sure this was a very uh, emotional experience for him. Uh, probably best uh, that, that he did not engage in an interview at this time, maybe. Yeah, after um, 16 years of uh, of tenure. But it is a wild thing to be reading because there are all these plans. And then it's just like, oh, I guess that's not going to happen. Right. Uh, he is, let's just say he's the first guy to leave a major selling book um this issue because i believe it's going to come up again later and we'll, we'll we'll talk about that later whenever he left the comics i quit reading x-men probably two or three issues later i didn't stick through all of jim lee's run um i associated chris claremont so closely with x-men that whenever anybody it, it wouldn't matter who took over writing it was going to be different you know he had that very soap opera melodramatic tone and when that left, it just felt dramatically different. Yeah, the 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 change in quality was was uh, pretty much instantaneous. And many of us we kept just through inertia of month in month out. Sometimes uh, week in week out, buying the new X Men comics. We we sort of kept it up for a little bit there, but uh, you know that would that would be what I would call the methadone stage where you're just (laughs) slowly weaning off until you can, uh, you know, cold Turkey be done with it. All right. Atomic comics, another comic shop ad here. They're based in Mesa, Arizona. I think at their peak, they had four stores around Phoenix area. They were a very big operation. One of the top 10, uh, I think diamond accounts. They went, out of business in 2011. They originally opened in 1988. Bubba's Comics Store was the initial uh, name of their store. That changed a year in. Um, They opened several locations. And then when the economy took a downturn in 2008, I guess business was tough for them. A 16-year-old crashed her car into their main store, their biggest store, severed a water line, caused over a million dollars in damage to the comics and product at the store. Uh, the store was closed for several months and essentially they just didn't recover. I do, I know just a little bit about like how, how business insurance works. And when it comes to, to product that could have an artificial value, like old comics, um, it is really hard to prove the value of an amazing Spider-Man one to an insurance company. So I'm sure that was like the, because this is the height of back issue fandom I'm sure that was the bulk of of the business, and I'm I'm quite sure that they didn't receive um, what they probably should have from any kind of insurance settlement or whatever. Yeah, and apparently it was a great store. Whenever they went out of business, there were you know lots of pros that came out and, and kind of lamented their their loss, wished them the best. People like Brian Bendis, uh, Warren Ellis, Jonan Vasquez, um, you know. So it, it was a store that that. A, you know, you're in business for almost 30 years. Uh, you're doing something right to, to maintain that kind of uh, longevity. If the guys from Atomic Comics are still around, uh, s- send us a message at uh, cartoonist.kfabe at gmail.com just to say how curious to know what you're up to these days. And if anybody knows, uh, by all means, put, some, put something down there in the comments. All right. So the uh, interview with Javier Salteris, primarily at this time known for Ghost Rider, the other book that I associate with him is Beasties. I don't know it. It was published, I want to say it was published by Axis Comics. So that was several years, well, a few years anyway, after this. But it was kind of another creator-owned line of comics, you know, following the line of Image Comics. Tribe was eventually published there. That's the other place that I know of Javier Salteris from, Um the interview goes through some of his background, whether he had formal art training or not. Um, he did not go to school for, for anything, but uh, he does mention the Andrew Loomis books, which 
are pretty famous. Um, one of the things that Wizard was important to me was trying to figure out how to be a cartoonist. So anytime somebody would drop a name or a book or anything on how to, uh, that was always something I would look into. So it's interesting. They misspell b- both first and last names of Andrew Loomis. Yeah, they spelled um, Br- Bridgman's <laughs> name incorrectly too. But but I actually, um, I can make an argument for, I can, I can make an excuse for for them getting Andrew Loomis's name wrong because those Andrew Loomis books, the the cartoonists of Javier's generation and before, they all talk about those drawing yeah. books. But those books were long out of print during during our day. You could not find these things anywhere. You had to go to an antique bookshop or something like this. So whoever was editing this this article, you're not finding Andrew Loomis's name anywhere. Because it's only recently that those books have come back into print. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't mean to be that critical about it, you know. It caught my eye too, but but you know, just to make an excuse for them, that like that sort of came to mind uh, because I was thinking about that time period, nineteen ninety one, and those books were not available. I, I surely was looking. I love this image of Ghost Rider. It really feels like, you know, it's this back wheel is pushing all the acceleration like there's so much weight to the image i i really dig it myself javier Salteris was really good at that at being able to capture this like kinetic feel that had a lot of weight he talks about in the interview when he was like in middle school sixth to eighth grade or so he met mark texiera and um almost like senpai kohai kind of relationship like you could look at his work and you talked about last episode how they meshed really well and you know mark tex was was able to kind of uh you know groom him early to be to be a sharp penciler yeah i always think of tex when i think of ghost rider and it's kind of interesting to me you know like when i was looking at this issue revisiting this issue i kept thinking about that you know um how long was Javier on Ghost Rider? And then you read the interview, and he was already off of it by the time this interview takes place. Some of the kayfabers at home might not know how the magazine business works. Uh, So for those who don't know about the production schedule and how these magazines are packaged, basically, the entire issue has to be finished three months before it hits the stands to to allow time for printing and distribution all these back-end jobs that are required to get the magazine to hit the newsstand so that you can purchase it. So you're basically, you know, this is 1991. This is the era um, of kind of delayed gratification, and uh, news was very slow at this time. Some of these things shook out differently even, you know, the day that these magazines came out, so just like that Chris Claremont interview. Absolutely. All right, so uh, another column on collecting comics in the 90s. <clears throat> this column mostly covers second printings. And at the time, I guess, mostly Marvel was experimenting with their second printings and doing variations, uh, adding gold foil, like on the Spider Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man, um, adding neon colors, glow-in-the-dark printing. There's a New Mutants 100 pictured here that has like a white background. The first printing was a dark blue background. So I don't want to say speculation, but it's talking about the demand for some of these second printings and how some of them, the demand is actually greater than for the first printing, which was kind of, uh, you know, it certainly was never that way before. Right, right. And this is what speculation is all about because now these shop owners don't know what the what the heck to buy. Do we invest heavily in the first printings, um, expecting there to be a second one, and and uh, investing the same amount of capital in those, or do or do we um, order more heavy on the second printings? These shops just had no idea how how to bet, and um, it's it screwed up their money uh, situation. S- stores started to to fail. You know that's that's going to come later, but this is a great piece to kind of illustrate the confusion of the the comics quote quote unquote market um the the writer i actually really like this article but he conflates a couple of things and, and and he he confuses a few things like like sort of at the end here he's talking about how publishers should continue to uh, to innovate and do new things 
to to build readership but many of these people especially around this time they are not reading anything so it's really a short money argument where where um they're creating a situation where money can change hands really fast but it has nothing to do with the longevity of comics and and uh you know editorially speaking from from my point of view the people who are thinking about the good of comics as a medium it's not coming from the corporate level. It's it's coming from independent publishers and frankly, just independent cartoonists who are kind of like thinking outside of the box, thinking of different audiences that are unserved, that um, can bolster and build uh, readerships. Uh, it has nothing to do with gold foil covers and things like that. Innovation's always going to come from... Uh, the fringes. Un- underneath the top spot. If you're on top, you don't really want anything to change. So here's an article on the history of Ghost Rider. Uh, I found this kind of interesting. You know, Ghost Rider started out not as a Marvel character and uh, had nothing to do with motorcycles. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't a real demon, wasn't a real ghost. Uh, started out as a Western character. It's a really interesting... They describe the character here, and he's very interesting because he wears... He puts phosphorescent paint on, so he essentially glows in, in the darkness. And then he has a cape that's black on the inside that he can flip around to make himself disappear. <laughs> it's it's a great idea. It's very simple, but it works, you know, especially in a comic book. It's black and white. Like, it's kind of a brilliant concept. And then eventually, as Marvel starts to uh, heat up, he's introduced in, in Marvel first as a Western character. And then later on, uh, he's brought in as the demonic biker that, that we all recognize you know, I, I don't know too much more to say about that. There's there's debate on creator, who the creator of that version of Ghost Rider is. Gary Friedrich is somebody who had sued Marvel over ownership. He died this year. So, you know, that that's part of his obituary is, is certainly credited as the co-creator of Ghost Rider at the very least. I was really into the 1990s Ghost Rider and sort of with sort of the same fervor as, as you. And that series spawned the... the Spirits of Vengeance uh, series where the Danny Ketch Ghost Rider of the 1990s teamed up with Johnny Blaze, the, the former Ghost Rider from the 70s. So just knowing that Johnny Blaze character, um, which that name was also co-opted by, by Method Man in the future who called himself John Blaze because of that, um, I would find the 70s Ghost Rider comics in, in back issue bins and, and you know at uh, old bookstores. And I was uh, significantly let down uh, with those comics compared to the kind of goth, um, industrial, Nine Inch Nails version of the 1990s uh, Ghost Rider. Yeah, it's much more of a circus bend in, in a way. Yeah, like an He's evil a stunt Knievel. rider. Yes, exactly. I did uh, want to call attention to a couple of old Ghost Rider comics because I do like those 70s. I, like you, I, I see them in back issue bins and have picked up quite a few over the years. So uh, Jim Shooter drew a couple of issues of comics to, I guess, let freelancers know how to do... You're blowing my mind. How, how to draw comics, the uh, the Jim Shooter editor-in-chief way. So this is Ghost Rider number 57. I think he also drew 56 or 58, um, but you see layouts by Jim Shooter here. And it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, I think his emphasis was on clarity. And so it's it's very much, you know, establishing shots and kind of what he's expecting out of people. A lot of the six panel grids, again, very straightforward, easy to follow, easy to understand. And um, he did several, several comics like this. It was, I think, both to illustrate how to do it and also quicker ways to do it so that they would get done on time. He also did two issues of uh, Spectacular Spider-Man, number 56 and 57. Um, and same same deal, you know, you can see his... His name in the credits there, layouts, Jim Shooter. A lot of mid shots from what I remember. <laughs> it's it's definitely an emphasis on clarity more than like a dynamic, exciting. Did Frank Miller do that cover? That is a Frank Miller cover. Good eye. Yeah, really nice. I've not, actually not seen that cover before. So something to look for when you're digging through back issue bins. And Ghost Rider is, is kind of a fun comic. You know, those old ones. This answers a question that we had uh, last last episode. Yes. What the heck does the Platinum Spider-Man number one even look like? So it was a metallic ink uh, version. Like this would be like a, a platinum color and the Spider-Man logo platinum. It's a lot of the webs platinum. But right here, it, it, 
it sort of lets the reader know like how these platinum books went out to the uh, the marketplace. I love one of only 10,000 in existence. Right, why? This is probably a top 100 comic book if it comes out today. <laughs> oh, yeah, Back sure. then, <laughs> super rare. <laughs> but it, it, it says right there that it was, it was given, how, how do they describe it? It was given to retailers um, who invested in? Yeah, given as a free, given free to retailers as a thank you for selling the record 2.8 million copies of Spider-Man number one. And they're giving away three of them here. So uh, that's pretty good. It's, it's a shame this has expired. I would send in the coupon for this one. This is an interesting article. Comics Librarianship by Randall W. Scott. This is a book review of a book that was published in 1991. And the premise is how to set up a comics library. Did you ever hear of the book? I looked it up after I saw this article. I had not heard of it until rereading this issue. He is the librarian at Michigan State University. He was a very early advocate for not just bringing comics into libraries and having special holdings of those, but also how to do it, which is a, an important part of that topic. Right, because the period of time that we're talking about, the trade paperback wasn't as ubiquitous uh, uh, a product as, as we have today. Like, he's talking about issues of comic book comic magazines in the library system yeah and furthermore i looked this book up on amazon because i am kind of interested in it's this an intriguing topic. article and, and i've never heard of the book used copies start at 159 dollars new copy 922 whenever i checked it out so I, th that's shocking to me it's, it's an academic book reprinted if there's demand for it and maybe there is comics are very popular today uh, especially in libraries and universities um, so pretty interesting. Way ahead of its time. And, and it probably just didn't get printed that much, but way ahead of its time. Yeah. And, and the reviewer is very positive about it. it says it's an easy book to read. Um, it's not too weighted in academia. So I would be interested in taking a look at it. Yeah, me too. Grading your comics. Once again, this is a page I wasn't interested in the first issue. Uh, Keep it rocking. Yeah couple of new photos over here one of the things that i really liked about wizard magazine was that i would be reading these comics and become fans of the cartoonists or, or writers and just see their names repetitively over the years in the different comics that i liked i didn't have many opportunities to see what these people looked like so getting a chance to check out their photographs in the magazine was was always kind of uh kind of a treat just to see what the heck uh these guys look like yeah, I, I was interested as well for reasons I can't explain, but <laughs> curious, I guess. Sometimes when you go to a comic convention, when when I was young, um, I would pop into a comic convention sort of knowing which car cartoonists and writers were going to be there. And without having any, without ever seeing photographs of these guys, if I would walk past them, it would depend uh, on who they were, but... You could tell, basically, you could tell that Larry Stroman is Larry Stroman without ever seeing a photograph of him. He he looks, his proportions in his face, like, are sort of the way he draws in a way. It's impossible not to use yourself as a model, you know, when you're trying to figure out an angle or, or if a feature looks right or an expression. I think everybody does that. And I can even remember early on seeing uh, in how-to guides, the idea of a mirror was one of the tools that you needed. Right. Um, so I wanted to call attention to Black Panther, Panther's Prey. This was a book I excitedly bought uh, when it came out new. I can't remember how I heard of it, but Dwayne Turner's the artist. And the reason this was significant for me, it's reproduced from his pencils. Wow. Which is pretty unusual at the time. And for me, trying, you know, trying to draw and collecting artists, like this was like a step up. This was a guy that, that was doing something that, you know, and that's how the article presented it. Um, you know, the art was so attractive that they didn't want to take a chance with ink. You know, they just figured out how to reprint this from the pencils themselves. So a couple of, uh, a couple of examples of early Dwayne Turner, but also early attempts by Marvel to just print a book pencils first. Um, you know, and, and a lot of artists have gone through this stage now as, as scanning and reproduction has gotten better and easier uh, this has become more common to experiment with just doing pencil art. I've drawn comics and pencils, um, but you, you see this quite a bit now. So, 
very early, early example of that. Gene Colan's the other guy I can think of who would have had some comics reproduced in pencil form yeah, pretty the, early on. But yeah, the Nathaniel Dusk miniseries. Very, very rare at this time. Some of these covers just do not show up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty great cover. It is a good cover. The hand coming out of the eyeball, out of the eye socket. I appreciated those those Clive Barker comics. I, I gave many of them a read. Very in quality. But yeah, but uh, sure. but but good ideas in in each. So this is another comic I wanted to uh draw a little bit of attention to. Faust number 1, uh Act 1 Love of the Damned. This is the North Star edition. Um this is actually the Rebel edition and Faust was a book that I found at a young age, probably one of the first books I got whenever I, I started going to a comic book store. Um, I remember the proprietor had no problem selling me this book. And the reason I think it's noteworthy in Wizard is this is a very uh, not kid-friendly book. To say the least. You know, I mean, this is a hard NC-17, uh, extremely violent. Um, but also a book that I loved because this is kind of Batman and, and Wolverine. You know, he has claws. He's, he's violent. So uh, this was this was one of my favorites. Still one of my favorites. You know what you should do, Jim. Uh, independent of of this episode, you should make uh, you should make a video and and expound on your uh, Faust knowledge and do a deeper dive into the world of yeah, Faust. Yeah, why not, man? That's the beauty of the of the cartoonist kayfabe channel. Leatherface. Can I tell you a story, please, before we get into into this? Uh, you know, I was born in 1982, and the steel mills here in Pittsburgh went away at that time, and so my dad had to start to travel to to different mills out of out of state um, to just make ends meet. And I say that because my parents know when I was conceived, and my dad knocked up my mother during a matinee double feature at the drive-in of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the A picture and Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was the B picture. Wow. And, and that's where I was invented. That explains a lot. I think so too, man. And, and if, you know, I, like I, I didn't ask for details like at the exact moment of insemination or anything like that. But if you know both of those movies, it was probably during uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes because that's quite a boring movie. <laughs> Um, My dad was romantic. One, one note on Leatherface, published by North Star, uh, same publisher as Faust, just a violent uh, horror publisher. Um, I was looking up Leatherface, see what I had on file, and I actually have uh, two of issue number one. And uh, it's a full color book, so that was something that surprised me whenever I picked it up. It seems like a black and classic black and white indie horror title, but. Uh, the, the the interior of that comic doesn't doesn't promise as much as the uh, as that advertisement does. Yeah, so this is the cover for issue three, and even the black and white doesn't do it justice because this is like a meat cleaver. That's it's kind of a strange cover, but uh, it's pretty good looking art for you know low rent horror. Um, Ghost Rider pull out poster. I don't know how long this feature went on, but Wizard often had their covers as like a centerfold pull-out poster. Right. Todd McFarlane's Invasion Comics. Justice League America with some Exorcist. Right, yeah, I think that was Adam Hughes. There's a long history of doing uh, homage covers um, to classic comic book covers, but imagine doing an homage <laughs> cover to a comic that came out six months before you know you drew right. your cover. Like that's that's how big Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man number one was. That people were copying the cover six months after it came out. 
New Mutants number 87, first appearance of Cable, up $15, now worth $40, uh, up $15 from issue one of Wizard. So hot, hot book. And it was probably worth more money than uh, New Mutants number 98, which uh, is the first appearance of, of Deadpool. Yeah, only six fifty. This is when you wanted to buy Deadpool's first appearance. That's for sure. And, th- and now the, the gulf between both, both of those is, is, is way different. Deadpool's worth significantly more. Punisher War Journal, number six, Punisher versus Wolverine. This was another one of probably my top or first five or six comics that I bought. Uh, brought this cover just because it's great. Like, it's it's such a classic to me of having, like, the two characters that are, that are squaring off. That's a pretty good... Uh, we looked at Todd McFarlane's Wolverine uh, Hulk showdown cover. To me, this is another classic. Jim Lee inking himself. Yeah, yeah. Good fit under under lit. You know, perfect, perfect cover. Wizard of Cards. Yeah, Stephen Seamus talking about the the non-sports card uh, trend that's been happening. Um, He describes the uh, the 1990 Marvel Universe Series 1 set and how it was a sleeper hit. So they only printed so much volume that did not um, meet the demands of the buying public and unopened cases of those cards um, were going for around 500 bucks at this time, which is pretty remarkable. And then on the heels of that, then then you started to get Yo MTV Raps cards, Desert Storm cards. I have a box of Desert Storm cards, I think, in my <laughs> attic. <laughs> oh, what a time. I actually still have my uh, Marvel universe series two cards and and they they were pretty important to me um around this time um in the in the back issue bins in the back issue bins old comics were just becoming more and more expensive there was a big market for these old comics so this sort of gave you a chance to kind of catch up on the characters that you already like you could read a little bit of biographical data on them um they would share like the comics where where they first appeared, but this this card set was my introduction to to many of these characters, and to this day, some of them still look off model to me if they're not drawn the way they are drawn, like in these cards. So, for instance, to me, this Sasquatch, he only has one eye, and so he looks weird to me if he's shown with two. <laughs> um. Art Adams did a lot of art on this series, and one of my favorite characters that he draws is is Ghost Rider, and you could tell that he's he's putting certain amounts of thought into everything that he draws. So he so he draws the skull relatively smaller than he would like a normal human head shape, which is not something that all Ghost Rider artists do. Like mm-hmm. like uh, you know, there's there's muscle and sinew and skin that that sits on top of that skull that builds the the size of the head that you and I are supporting on our necks but he notices that and uh so he takes all of that excess off to to reveal this little this little beetlejuice head <laughs> and then there's one other character that um that doesn't look right to me um in his real incarnation um because it, it's uh it's loki this Loki card right here, um, I I always thought that he had a mustache, like mm-hmm. a, like a Tom Selleck mustache there, because I just didn't understand a lot of a lot of like I didn't understand what they were trying to tell me with right. with that image. Um, so whenever I see Loki without a mustache, it doesn't look right to me. The other great thing about this series of cards is there are cards that talk about some some um, great battles within yeah. the comics, and then on the back. It describes what happens in the battle and then what issues of what comics um, these battles take place. So that gave me like a starting point for just kind of my comics collecting when I was a little boy. Uh, So I got this set when I was in third grade. Actually, my mom got me a box of comics for like my birth, my birthday when I was eight years old or whatever. And there were enough cards in there, like enough packs for me to put together a set. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that we'll get into a few of the different sets of cards that came out, you know, following this success. Um, those are great, though. I like the Art Adams stuff. It's really strong. Whiz Quiz. Any favorite matchups for uh, for battles? 
<laughs> Wizard becomes, like, after issue 75, probably a little bit before, they start to lean heavy into this kind of uh, fanboy nonsense, and then and then that's when I check out completely. You know, like like early on, for the first couple of years, they really do a very good mix of fanboy and inside baseball, how sausage is made sorts of stuff. Toying around with Brian Cunningham. Were you a big toy collector, Ed? I was a big toy collector, especially around this period of time. When, when I was a little boy, I grew up with the Secret Wars Marvel figures and uh, the, the Superpowers ones. And just with the photos that they have illustrated here, it's like I have almost all that stuff, man. So my, my Hawkman has long ago lost his wings. Like these, <laughs> these figures moved with me maybe a dozen times in my life. And what they're talking about on the left-facing page is just the release of the X-Men toys. And, and the kayfabers at home know, know I'm all about those X-Men, man. So it's like, there goes that Wolverine. There goes that Colossus. I long ago lost this, this uh, Cyclops, man. But, you know, we have, we have the Jim Lee one. And I actually <laughs> never saw the Magneto with, that has the, the helmet that comes off. That helmet that comes off looks massive. I know it does, man. Because like, <laughs> that was always else? a weird thing with toys. Like for, for this stuff to function right, the scale would be all over the place. He tells a funny story about um, trying to buy toys or wanting to buy toys whenever he was, I guess, fifteen, and felt self conscious about it. So he would make a comment about, "Oh, this would be good for a little Kevin." Right, <laughs> loud he, enough for everybody to hear it. Yeah, he's in the store with his mom, and he sees. He sees an action figure that he digs and he says exactly what you just said to try to try to save what little self-esteem he still had. <laughs> and, and we're laughing, but we're laughing in an era where we've been living in about 20 years of geek chic. And this era back then, I mean, fandom uh, toward comics, whatever, was really frowned upon by the mainstream. I mean, our, his dad was in Vietnam. You know what I'm saying? Right. His dad killed people. I was not a big toy collector, but I have friends who were. And I know this sense of like self-loathing or trying to be private about it or whatever uh, that I've had friends express that. So it's funny to, to see his story there. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a quite a charming article and, and very quaint and indicative of that time right before the geeks took over. Oh, you know, the other cool thing about those, those figures that I was showing off was that... Um, it was a, a chance, like, you could only put out a Wolverine figure in the brown and gold costume, like, one time, and those, that was the X, that was the X-Men line, so there's, like, a lot of figures that they were able to put out, but when they put out the, uh, the Batman figures during the Michael Keaton era, it's like, how many of these figures are you going to put out, and they try to figure out all these creative ways to, um, I can read a few. Yeah, please Bruce do. Bruce Wayne Batman. Okay. Crime Attack Batman, <laughs> Iron Winch Batman, Tech Shield Batman, Shadow Wing Batman, Power Wing Batman, <laughs> Thunder Whip Batman, Wall Scaler Batman. Now I'm surprised he, they got away with that one. Now here's the thing though. Blast Shield Batman. Those Batmans probably still looked like Batman. It it got into such a weird place where, say, this would be season one. <laughs> so on season two, there would be like Arctic Batman and it's the Dark Knight with a white costume. And then there's like Firefight Batman and he has construction yellow or like fluorescent orange. You know That's what I fantastic. mean? fantastic. Sure. So just having a, a character where it's like, okay, this is Batman. This is Hawkman. You know, that was, that was what the old era promised whenever the line would be company wide rather than focusing on on one character. This ad yes. seems completely inappropriate today. Yeah, like uh, uh, Crazy John's comics and psycho paraphernalia. What could that be? Or what yeah, the psycho paraphernalia, I I I I'm at a loss. That that's st that stood out to me too. But the taglines kill me. Or one flew over the comic shop. Ah, not too good. <laughs> Where the prices are so low they're insane. It's uh, it's, it's a like real crazy seventies. Yeah, yeah. Used, it, used car feels like Stan talk. Lee uh, when he wasn't on his soapbox, maybe writing ad copy here. I think that psycho paraphernalia thing was probably pointing to, to those um, 
the Loom Panics books and and the um, Paladin Press books of of the 70s, 80s, 90s, like, you know, post Abby Hoffman, still this book kind of books where it's like an entire book on how to like hide contraband in your house, like how to hollow out your, your table legs and to, to hide like dime <laughs> I bags and I stuff. think you're giving Crazy John more credit than... Uh, uh, you're probably right. <laughs> I think sure. it was just uh, collectors who were super into collecting their their stuff. Yeah, I guess like I'm just thinking about some of the more interesting uh, comic shops that, that I've experienced that would have a section of just like subversive literature right. or whatever, like that would, you know, a whole bookshelf on how to grow marijuana in in your bathtub or whatever all right uh shall we play a game i played some of these games right before uh right before you got here i gave that wolverine game a shot published by by ljn which the people at home who know ljn games know that they are pretty much universally awful um i never played that wolverine game uh before today i gave it a shot and uh, it's actually, it's not as bad as the previous LJN uh, Marvel game that they put out. Uh, the X-Men one is kind of universally panned. It's incredibly hard. It's one player, but there are two characters on the screen. So there's like an artificial intelligence uh, character that, that is running around with you. And he gets stuck in walls and, and, <laughs> and can't advance the screen. Terrible game. The Wolverine game is less bad. One thing I do like about this article, though, is that it really roots um, the release of this magazine to a kind of pop culture point in time that that we can illustrate by just talking about the the video games that are kind of forthcoming and on the horizon at this point. So the the um, the guy who's writing the article is talking about how the Super Nintendo uh, release is is impending. Mm -hmm. um, the Genesis Sega is about to switch its pack-in game from um, from Altered Beast, which is, that's the Genesis that I bought in yeah. like 1989. That um, was my Genesis as well. Yeah, and uh, they're switching the pack-in game to this new uh, game that sounds pretty hopeful to them called Sonic the Hedgehog right here. And uh, another thing that they're kind of calling attention to is that they are going to be releasing um, the Sega CD uh, within within, you know, the next couple of months or something. All right, the monthly top 10. Always one of my favorite features. Um, most of these books would stay the same from month to month, maybe move around a little bit. Uh, I thought, you know, highlighting some of the new titles this month, um, New Warriors, I think, is the main new book. Um Uncanny X Men two eighty one might be a new one, but the big new one is is New Warriors. You know, most of this is dominated by the X books, which were all the rage. Not too much movement there. Right. Yeah. New Warriors number one. Did you pick that up when when it came out? I did, and I loved it. Uh, Mark Bagley art, uh, clear, cartoonish, very attractive art, and it was a new team of young characters, which I loved. You know, I was probably thirteen, fourteen. It was awesome. We've talked about new series being a place that, you know, you could start if Spider-Man was an issue 320. It was nice to get a number one that was like, this is my book. I'm reading it from the beginning. And New Warriors really hit that note for me. I would try almost every new number one. That was one that I had no expectations going in and just really enjoyed. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. But because I was such an X-Men fan, New Mutants, you know, the mutant books. The reason why I started picking up the New Warriors books was because Gideon from Rob Liefeld's New Mutants shows up uh, pretty early, and so I had to see what, what he was up to. It's interesting in pr our perspective from 2018. Uh, you know, you have New Mutants 87 first cable, but you don't have Deadpool Not at all. Here. And Gideon was another one of those characters that showed up with Deadpool. And you think of Rob Liefeld's characters and Gideon really just never turned into anything. No, if you reread those comics, I don't even know that he was anything right then. Like, I, like there's no indication of like what that character is or what they were really planning. I think this feature, this is the first issue this appears in. I don't think this is in issue one. And it's the top 100 from August 1991. But it's also the top 10 from August 1990 and August 1989. And one thing that is clear is DC's influence on these top 10 lists. It just goes down 
you know, it, it's not bad here. Batman and Legends of the Dark Knight have the top two spots in 1989. This is probably coming off of the success of the Batman movie at the time. Detective is number four. So you have three Batman books there in the top in the top four spots. Um, X-Men number three, by the way, always a top contender. Then you move on to August 1990. Batman is still in the number three spot, but DC Comics, uh, you know, they have two Batman books in the top 10, but it's really, you know, stepping down. And by the time you get to 1991, here we are, um, X-Men dominates the first five spots, but it's all the way down to number 13 before you get to a DC book. Um, yeah, pretty remarkable stuff. Kind of a tough stretch there for for DC, trending trending downward over those two years. Yeah, at this moment, Mar- Marvel was doing everything right. I believe they had nearly seventy percent of the market share. All right, so uh, picks from the Wizard's Hat. These are upcoming books that are books to look out for in August ninety one. Spider Man number sixteen, artist writer Todd McFarlane. Blau, classic issue. They make no mention of it in the little missive about that issue, but this would be uh, Todd McFarlane's final issue of of the series. In fact, right here on the cover, it's it's called out uh, Spider Man saying "Bye, Todd," and uh, he he sort of was planning on retiring from comics, from from what I remember, and it all had to do. Yes, it all had to do. Now, there, I'm sure there's a combination of many things that were happening that, that he had to deal with editorially. But for him, he was talking about the final straw was this panel sequence right here. I believe what happened in on his original page, probably right around here, is hmm. we got to see we got to see this sword from Shatterstar go directly into Juggernaut's eyeball. And uh, you know, Tom Tom DeFalco or Jim Salakrup or Whoever the, the editor was on this thing, uh, that that pushed that pushed their limits. One of the things I liked about the Spider Man series was that uh, McFarlane would would answer the um, the fan mail in the in the back, but the the proper editor was was so kind of cuckolded uh, at 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 that moment that he had to also put his rebuttals <laughs> back there. You could tell that there was that there was strife behind the scenes because. Because the the editor would sometimes flat out say that Todd was wrong in those back letter pages. Like I remember he answered one reader and said that he could do a comic that had absolutely no words if he wanted to. And Jim Salakrup has this whole piece. No, 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 Todd, this is where I draw the line. Comics are a marriage between words and pictures. Not not even talking about, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the silent issue of right. uh, G.I. Joe came out a decade before this and proved that that's not necessary. But earlier in this issue, Chris Claremont leaves X-Men. Right here, Todd McFarlane is done with Spider-Man. They're heavy hitters. They're top contenders. They're champions. The people who sold millions and millions of books for Marvel are going away. Just look at the top ten. You know, Claremont and McFarlane represent seven out of the top ten slots. There it is. That's a big loss. For sure. And this issue of Spider-Man continues in X-Force number four. Were you on board with X-Force uh, throughout the the tenure of Rob Liefeld's run? I loved X-Force. I loved Rob Liefeld. At the time, I was a bigger Liefeld fan than Jim Lee. Um, you know, and I was buying this stuff off the newsstand. So when a new issue of, of these books came out, they were my favorite comics at the time. Very exciting. And I loved X-Force. This issue in particular comes up a lot in conversation uh, amongst amongst cartoonists because of the the color on the interiors gets really wild, man. It gets very day glow. That that's that's not a that's not a bad page, but as we get deeper and deeper, you see these like weird blues and this like hundred percent green against like this hundred percent orange red thing. Um, all these. Yeah, this is a pretty crazy wild with some coloring choices there. Whenever we happened upon this comic, and I've had this conversation with many, many Yeah, this this is like some of the best. GW Bridge with this weird blue and brown all over his face. We would always talk about 
what was Brian Murray, the the colorist, like what was he trying to pull off? It it felt very, very bleeding edge and and new and vibrant. And and he's he's clearly trying something that that just isn't working, but maybe he's on to something. And I actually discovered the truth behind the matter. I was at WonderCon earlier this year, and Dan Frega, who will probably come up in conversation uh, during the format when we talk about the formation of Image and Rob Liefeld's Extreme Studios, was giving me a tour of Rob Liefeld's homestead and showing me where where all of the locations for Extreme Studios was. And I, I brought up this issue, and was talking about the the weird color. And Dan Frega, who went to draw a bunch of uh, Rob Liefeld books in the future. He knew exactly the issue I was talking about with the weird color, and he dismissed all of our theories because Brian Murray started out, he was a colorist for Neil Adams Continuity Studios, and the the color charts that they used, he simply thought were ubiquitous across comics, that if you if you um, provide a guide using X color chart um, for Continuity Studios or DC Comics or Marvel Comics, the, the results would be the same. And so he used the continu continuity studios color charts while he was while he was um, delegating what the final color would look like to the color separators. So he sends that off only to discover that Marvel uses a different color chart with each of the, the colors are just shifted kind of over to two places. And and this is uh this is the result of um, of that simple mistake. That's an amazing story. You wonder if the color if the color separators somebody must have seen this and thought this is very strange. Yeah, you but know the way comics are made. They were just, on. they were just doing a Fixing job. The next man. issue, yeah. They were just doing a job. Um, Armageddon continues. This is uh, the book that DC landed in the top. This is their top book of the month. Uh, crossover i read at the time a little underwhelming don't remember a lot of details from that yeah me neither legion of the night um steve gerber and wills portacio pretty interesting it was marvel's monster characters omac one by john byrne i don't know if you remember this book but it was black and white right but he used that duo tone. yeah it was a very interesting looking book right around this era he, he john byrne must have must have gotten a hold of of a, a small horde of that craft tint duo tone board because he used it on Namor, he used it on Omac. And I think it was used in some of the uh, Next, Next Men. Men. Yeah, you're right. So other recommendations by, by Wizard as to books that are coming out that you may want to pick up. And number ones. Um, again, I don't know how long this feature stays in, in Wizard, but uh, it's kind of neat to go back and see what were the new books and if any of them stuck around. Um, the one that I pulled out from this list was uh, Night of the Living Dead, number one, from Fanico. Uh, not to be confused with Fanographics. Um, not sure why I have this book, how I came to get this book, but Night of the Living Dead celebrating its 50th anniversary, so uh, seemed like the, the right book to pull out. Fanico is an interesting publisher. They came out of a comic shop in Albany, New York. Uh, they did stuff with Kevin Eastman, mostly horror-type comics, this comic is, is a good example of that. You know, it's adaptation of the movie. It's a painted comic in black and white. So pretty indicative of what this company would do. A lot of independent comic book publishers begin as, as stores. Uh, I believe Mike Richardson had a store before he started Dark Horse Publishing. And the other one that comes to mind is New England Comics, NEC, which... Um, most famously was a publisher for the Tick comics by Ben Edlund, who was just a kid who came, and it sort of seems like it's the same story throughout, man. Some kid comes through the store who has a lot of talent. I forget who the publisher of Space Beaver was, uh, but I think it was, maybe it's called Harrier Comics or something. Um, and, you know, Derek Rob Robertson mm -hmm. was just a kid who came to the shop and had a lot of talent, and, and comics were doing good at that time that the the proprietor of the shop just put some money down and, and published his comics. Same same thing with Ben Edlund and, and the Tick, and you know those those shops bet on the right horses. So this is a weekly breakdown of books that are shipping throughout August. Well, I guess throughout September. Valiant is starting to show up. 
Yeah, they're on their shipping list. Um, Valiant is a company that Wizard definitely promotes heavily, uh, especially as they get into speculations and the hot books. So that that's a company we will see more and more of. But that's pretty great. Barry Windsor Smith, uh, some er some work in those early Solar issues. Just to root this issue in a certain time and place, uh, once again, um, this is an era before we knew Japanese animation as anime, and uh, it was pretty much universally called uh, Japanimation uh, here here in the States up until probably around um, the release of the Ghost in the Shell movie. I think I remember seeing Jap animation as as like the the section in you know West Coast video, or or whatever. And you know most if your uh, if your mom and pop video shop was hip, there would be a small Jap animation section. If it was unhip or corporate, like a blockbuster or something, you would find maybe one or two um, anime tapes in a section called special interest. That should be an I, like animation. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> this is a strange article. So this is about a couple of ba a couple of Dracula comics that are coming out, written by the same guy. Yes, written by Martin Powell. I don't know these books at all. Um, Some of them don't even come out. There's one called something like Dracula Rex. <laughs> as far as I know, there there's not a single issue of that that you can discover. You know. It, it, they just don't exist. Yeah, it's this it's is a pretty straightforward piece. You know, it's promoting this book. Yep, Dracula Rex, 1990. 1990. <laughs> it's just strange. <laughs> you Maybe know, one I, year before this. <laughs> I think. Um, I think I Pat, that's a period piece. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat Olaf draws mm -hmm. Dracula Rex, which bless him. Yeah, for sure. He does. Uh, there, there is one story that he talks about though. Battle for Smithville, Dark Asylum. It's an eight-part miniseries. I think this is the story, but it's all like the Universal monsters descend on this town. Is that the right one? Yes. And uh, I thought that sounded really cool, but again, I don't know that that book was ever published. Weird article, like you said. I'd Eternity like to... was the publisher of these. Or at least listed, you know, if the books had come out. What was the most popular Eternity comic? Because they, they seem to exist for a while, so they must have made some bones at some point that made it possible for them to just keep going through the black and white booms. Uh, they at one point had Shuriken. And that was a big deal? I don't think that was a big moneymaker, but it was a book I liked. Sure, so, like, I'm sure. aware that they published them after their initial... They, they You know, that was self-published by Reggie Byers under Victory, and then I guess Eternity bought it. And then I think Malibu bought Eternity. I don't know how that shakes out, but I do remember that uh, Pirate Corps by Evan Dorkin was an Eternity book. But but I just, the company perplexes me. If anybody knows uh, the details on what their biggest successes were, how they were able to stay in business for so long, uh, make some mention in the comments or, or email us at uh, cartoonist.kfabe at gmail.com yeah i wonder what manga they they might have been an early manga publisher i can't remember so here we have uh the wizard times again <laughs> wizard just you know trying out different different ideas uh more power to him on that um this is conspiracy to commit comics and it's about stephen grant's comic badlands which is about the jfk assassination and this would have been fall 91 um, Oliver Stone's JFK movie came out December 91. Mm. Uh, that's never mentioned in here, but, you know, it seems like a, a buzz, you know, that was a popular concept, I guess, at this time. So it's it's him just talking about background on this series, how it came to be, uh, what you can expect as a reader from it. I've never read this. I'm not sure if it's a black and white book or in color. It's kind of a strange... You know that they're adding the second color here. I'm Mr. pretty sure that's not how the book was printed, but just a choice, I guess, of editorial, you know, art art director maybe. Right. Yeah. Stephen Grant. He wrote. He wrote a lot of, a lot of stuff around this time. I know. I know that. Uh, that Whisper was one of his more popular. I liked Whisper comics. I did. I did as well. And it, in this in this uh, interview, he's just talking about how 
you know, the superhero comic as a genre is just getting kind of played out and how he's going to be spending uh, the bulk of his his career at this point writing things within, you know, a noirish uh, kind of crime crime uh, genre or whatever. Yeah, I think he did that book with Mike Zack, The Damned. I think that was Stephen Grant. I know they definitely did that Punisher miniseries that is pretty highly coveted. Yeah, so Stephen Grant, uh, you know, it's interesting him talking about crime as a genre for comics. Obviously, that was, you know, a, a popular genre in the 50s, kind of went away as superheroes were dominant. And then about this time, Miller's doing Sin City at this time uh, it, in Dark Horse Presents, which I think helped to reestablish the crime genre, which now it's, you know, alive and well. Um, so, And this would have been a Dark Horse book, I believe, right? Yes. Badlands? Yeah. All right, these are the books you want to watch for. If you can find a good deal on these before your store marks up their price and realizes what they have, snatch them up. New Teen Titans number two, uh, first appearance of Deathstroke the Terminator, kind of like DC's answer to The Punisher, according to Wizard. The, this Uncanny X-Men number 266 with the first appearance of Gambit is 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 new for the magazine. What What is kind of most funny to me about this issue is that a lot of people know that Gambit was cre- created by Jim Lee, but he doesn't draw Gambit's first appearance even on the cover. The cover's drawn by Andy Kubert, and uh, the interior artwork is, is drawn by a guy named Mike Collins. So I remember th- um, I missed this issue when it was uh, coming out, but I was able to scoop it up when it was you know, maybe $5 or something. And very excited to see, you know, what Jim Lee was was up to, and really sort of being let down by the interior right. artwork. It's not it's it's not bad. It's 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 good comics. But I think Gambit is one of these characters that I pretty much associate with with Jim Lee. Like it's like he only he can kind of draw Gambit correctly in my eyes or something. Future stars interview with Sam Keith. Uh, I, I'm a fan of Sam Keith's. I was a Sam Keith mark from early on. I was reading the Hulk uh, in monthly issues. So whenever he his fill-in issue came out, this was the first Sam Keith that I ever saw and absolutely loved it. He drew the Hulk with stubble. He did. He drew veins and stuff in the Hulk. Um, it was a lot of things I hadn't seen before, and it was very dark. It's set in this train, um, a lot of shadows, which plays up Sam Keith's strengths. He leans heavy toward like a Bernie Wrightson vibe uh, during that issue. It's very much like a monster. He's, he's showing the Hulk like a monster, and it, it, I thought it looked great. As a Hulk fan, I was thrilled with it. So I thought it was interesting, his biggest influences. He started off with guys like Crum and Gilbert Shelton. Right, it's, like he, cool. it's like he went backwards. Like yes. Most cartoonists start at a Kirby place or whatever the comics are that you could get at the dime store, and then... And then you grow into the undergrounds and the alternative comics, but he went backward. It, ma- it makes me think that he had a big brother who was cool or something like that because you, been. you don't accidentally find Robert Crumb comics unless he's just, you know, unless he's being pretentious or something. Yeah, it seems like an unlikely that he would be pulling that out for, for any sort of ironic or pretentious reasons in 1991. Yeah, I guess. That would have been pretty early. And he, I think he's from California, so underground comics may have had, been a little easier to come by. Yeah, for sure. This was noteworthy. His first published comic uh, in the back of a Kamiko book called Max the Hare. He likes that name Max, huh? Well, and, and Max kind of is rabbit-like with his giant feet. So For sure. And, and when those comics that he made... Characters from the Max are in there. There are those little those little cartoony guys called the Is, who yes. are just like the the little bulbous heads with the feet. He drew those characters back in those Kamiko primer primer mm-hmm. days. Um, so his his sketchbooks were, were at least very dominated with the kinds of things that he would be drawing in the in the near future. I always love the way that he drew these like these like tattered clothes and stuff it's absurd how many he's drawing this has to be the apex of of his tattered clothing yeah i think so (laughs) and 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 i feel like i could kind of project into his mind and know what he was thinking at the time and i bet it's like you draw one and you really like the way it turns out and then you so you draw like another and then you kind of 
you know, forest for the trees kind of thing. It just dominates. It was always important to me how guys would draw like the hair on Wolverine's arms. And, uh, and he was pretty good at it. He would get a lot of like uh, shadow effects, you know, and, and really create like the rounding of the forms yeah. through thickening up that hair and making shadows out of it. Yeah, that's how you do it correctly. Like uh, you'll see a lot of cartoonists, they'll just almost do like a straight line of body hair and it doesn't add any definition. This was one of my favorite Wolverine images of all time. I just loved it. That was a cover, I think, on Marvel Comics Presents. Hard to compete with it. Oh, uh, they ask him, um, what was the last comic you read? Eight Ball by Fanographics. It's a black and white art book that nobody reads. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to become a pretty routine feature, like, uh, down the line as we continue continue um, these podcasts. A lot of people were reading Eight Ball... Acme Novelty Library, and Hate. And that's going to become more and more apparent as, as we keep this thing going. He says that this is his <laughs> uh, his favorite panel he ever drew. Yeah, I couldn't tell if he was joking about that. that one to me was one I thought he might have been playing with the interviewer <laughs> a little bit. But then you you see it and it's like, God damn, that, that is beautiful. He cites it too. Incredible Hulk 368, page 27, fourth panel. Oh, he ain't playing around, man. <laughs> See, I'm sure that was at the front of his thoughts whenever uh, he was asked that question. He also gets a shot in on, on Quasar whenever he's asked about uh, who he'd like to draw. And, and he talks about drawing Hulk, Wolverine, Ghost Rider, maybe Doctor Strange. And he's so happy that he's been doing these great characters without having to work his way from the bottom up, like with Quasar. Yeah, yeah. And and Greg Capullo was drawing it at the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Shots fired. Um. The questions are all dumb, but I think uh, in the first issue, there was a question posed by Ben Do Ben Dover, and his his cousin Phil McCrack <laughs> asks the question right here about John Byrne writing the X Men. Oh man, good stuff. Uh, I didn't notice anything noteworthy in shows. I don't know if there was anything that stood out to you. Nope. Um, almost all the PA shows are always uh, Reading, Philly area. We'll, we'll get a Pittsburgh appearance, I think, at some point. It's going to be coming up within <laughs> within the next, I'd say, five to ten issues. And uh, finally, back cover is an ad for uh, Marvel's Horror Monster Comics, uh, published in their imprint Epic Comics. Um, some standout stuff here. We mentioned Legion of Night, Steve Gerber, and Wills Protasio. Pretty interesting. Wills is kind of at the top of his game at this time so him doing monsters is pretty interesting we see that again in wet works uh his creator own book uh at image tomb of dracula classic that's coming back um larry wachowski uh writing hellraiser book of the damned now known as lana of the famous wachowskis who uh who created the, the matrix trilogy created and directed the matrix trilogy yeah and longtime comics fans you know in addition to doing some writing for marvel in the 90s here um, post matrix they published comics as burly man uh, was their imprint and it published uh, jeff darrow's shaolin cowboy and steve scrosi's or scross uh, doc frankenstein both and both of those guys did um you know jeff darrow and, and scross did uh Matrix comics, and I believe Scross did the the storyboards for the Matrix movie, at least the first one. Yeah, I, I was a big fan of his, and and I guess we'll come to that maybe much much later. Right. Um, but yeah, interesting that these cartoonists that do storyboards, uh, especially high profile uh, movies like that, and then this Man Thing graphic novel by Steve Gerber and Kevin Nolan would not see print until uh, probably several years ago, but it was like two thousand and eleven or something. Whenever that finally came out. Very interesting comic and story, but it, for whatever reason, was delayed for, you know, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Ger Gerber was a rebel rouser, man. So he, he would, he would, uh, he would get loud and, and, and sort of fight, fight for his rights, basically quite often, you know, creator of, uh, Howard the Duck. And no, another creator who sued Marvel. Over, did he, did yeah, he yeah. ultimately sue them? Yeah. I knew, I knew he definitely turned up and he was definitely loud about the fact that, um, when, at the height of Howard the Duck popularity, that comic was going for more than he was paid to draw the entire issue. Like if he would have just been given a few copies of the comic, he he would have, uh, you know, made more than he did 
writing the, the, the comic. He was a very creative writer. He wrote a lot of G.I. Joe uh, episodes of the animated uh, G.I. Joe cartoon. It's true, and uh, Destroyer Duck with uh, Jack the King Kirby. So that concludes Wizard number two. Uh, be on the lookout for the next episode of, of Cartoon Kayfabe, uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe, where we're going to cover Wizard Magazine number three. One of the highlights is going to be an interview with Simon, Simon Bisley, who, who painted this piece right here. Yeah, one of my favorite cartoonists, especially from, from that time period. Yeah, it's going to be fun to, to uh, examine that piece, man. So signing off, I'm Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And uh, this is episode two of Cartoonist Kayfabe. Subscribe if you haven't already. We have a platform. We have accounts on every social media platform that matters. There's a Cartoonist Kayfabe fa Facebook page. Uh, there's a Twitter account. Follow us there for updates at at Cartoon Kayfabe. The Instagram account is Cartoonist Kayfabe. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Ed Piscor, and I'm on Instagram as well. Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Jim Rugart. If you have any uh, detailed messages that, that you would like to uh, send our way, our email address is cartoonist.kfabe at gmail.com. And uh, we'll, we'll be here again uh, probably this time next week with our examination and page-by-page -page commentary of Wizard Magazine number three.